Yeah, well, I've had, uh, you know, I've made the mistake of having full-time work uh, a few times in my life, but, um, you know, uh, everyone makes mistakes. And uh, I eventually learned that um, I really didn't enjoy all of my life when I was spending so much time doing something that was just kind of okay for other people's profit. And, um, you know, I have nothing against other people's profit, but I wanted to love what I do. So I actually quit doing what I did after saving up about a year's worth of work, deciding that I would only do what I love and see what life would be like. I have mixed feelings about technology. There's things I love about it, and there's things that are kind of not so good about it. But, you know, uh, there, I teach the things I love about it, and uh, we can do so many cool things with it. You know, with technology, we can make beautiful music. With technology, we can compute things that would have taken, you know, years or decades before and do it in seconds. With technology, we can make the world an incredibly better place. With technology, we can blow up the planet. We can hurt people. We can kill people. But what we do with it is um, up to each of us to take the responsibility. We have to take that responsibility and do the right thing and hopefully do it consciously and not just do it for its own sake. Uh, I love the concept of open source. I think it's totally the way of the future. So the old way is that uh, this idea is mine and you stay away from it or I'm going to sue your ass. I mean, at least in my country. And, uh, but with open source, it's more of, I really love what I do. Check it out. This is really cool. I want to show you how I did it so maybe you can have other ideas and make it better. And um, my Everything I do is open source. Everything, including how I make a living. <laughs> TV Be Gone is open source, and it's the only way I've made money since 2004, and anyone can just go online and copy it. And the thing is, that's great. It works fantastic for me, because every time someone copies it, then they show other people what they did, and they're enthusiastic about it. They use my name, and then other people might buy my product or they might do it and uh, I don't get a cent but then they show other people this is PR that I could never afford to buy otherwise it's oh. fantastic I'm not sure. I'd, I'd love to find out. I mean, if more and more people do stuff on their own because they think it's really cool, then more and more people are spending time doing things that might be enjoyable. Hopefully more enjoyable than sitting in front of some TV, wasting their time and having time of their life go away forever, never to come back again. Um, you know, and if people are doing things for themselves, then they, can, uh, they don't need as much money to do what they think is enjoyable and hopefully they don't have to work as much to make that money so they can spend more time doing what they think is enjoyable. I think DIY is fantastic. Yeah, you know, if you know a lot about this stuff, you can do pretty much anything, but you don't have to know a lot to do incredibly cool things. Uh, the way I love teaching is teaching people who know absolutely nothing or very little and want to learn more. And anyone can learn this stuff. It doesn't take a guy in a white coat. It can be anybody. You know, little kids, big kids, it just doesn't matter. Um, like most of the people who are over there soldering right now, who I taught today, had never soldered ever before in their lives. And they're finishing their projects, it's going to work. They'll be able to turn off TVs everywhere they go, making the world a better place. They'll be able to make blinky lights, or whatever they're making. Um, you know, and they did it themselves. This is a sense of accomplishment. And if they like it, they can do more. Making one of my kits, you learn that you can do this stuff. If you want to learn more, there's so much available. And just by changing a little bit what exists, you can make it cooler. And that's what hacking is all about. And then if you share it, then other people can help you, and you can help them, and uh, things grow from there. Uh, hackerspaces are all about that. So they're supportive communities where people explore and do, hopefully, what they love. And we all need community and we all need to express ourselves creatively and hackerspaces bring all of that together and it's fantastic that way. And hopefully people will find what they love and see that other people love it too. Maybe they can even make a living doing what they love because so many other people love it and if enough people uh, love it then maybe their company starts growing and they need help and they can hire people from their community. That's helping everybody.
you ask a thousand hackers what hacking is, you might get a thousand answers. But for me, it's taking what is, improving upon it to the best of your ability, and then sharing it. Because everything, no matter how much you know, you uh, have other people know stuff that you don't. And no how, matter how little you know, you know things that others don't know. And so sharing what you know with others and learning from others in this supportive community, I mean, that's, that's what makes me love hacking. Well, we could see that people, you know, what we call hacking today is this ethos that was created at uh, MIT Model Railroaders in the 1950s, even before computers. Uh, these people wanted to make incredibly awesome model railroads and they wanted to do something that couldn't exist by just going out and buying it. So they took things that existed that weren't intended for model railroads and used them for model railroads and they shared them not only with each other but model railroad clubs everywhere. And um, uh, that's what hacking is all about and that's the ethos we still have. Of course people were doing that before the 1950s. We've been doing that ever since we've been a species on the planet. But, you know, that's the first time it was called hacking. Well, that's up to each individual. So <laughs> I've taught over 40,000 people how to solder, and I haven't followed every one of them home. But, um, uh, you know, I do know some stories because people have either told me or I see them again at another workshop. So, like this one woman, uh, I taught her how to solder at a Maker Fair in San Francisco. And then a year later, she's at the Maker Fair again, and she's making more kits, not only mine, but other people's. And then a year later, she's making all of these things on her own, and she's totally into it. Um, uh, other examples, I've taught kids who have severe learning disabilities how to solder. And unfortunately, these kids have very little sense of accomplishment in their lives. And uh, just making a little blinky light makes them feel great. They made this. They can show off their friends or they can go off and turn TVs off and show their friends. And then they have the confidence to do other things in their lives after that. It's great. Traditional education? Yeah. It can be useful. Um, unfortunately, it seems to be failing us at the moment. Uh, what we call traditional uh, education now is designed for the industrial age, putting kids in rows and columns and then responding to a bell every 53 minutes or whatever. This is perfect for creating good little workers in a factory, but it's not perfect for the world we live in because the industrial era is long dead. So not only that, but every country has problems with their education system otherwise. Uh, in, in the United States it's terrible, we're horribly underfunded and it's all about standardized tests and not about learning anything that's required or even desired for living a life anyone wants to live. So we need somehow to fill in the voids that uh, were left behind by the education systems going down the tubes. Hackerspaces are one way where there's supportive community for people to learn what they want to learn and need to learn to live lives they really want to live. Um, you know, there are other ways of people getting together for this too, you know, like unschooling or what, homeschooling or whatever. Um, but we have to somehow come together as a people and support each other so that we can learn what we want to learn, so we can live lives that are fulfilling. I would love that. I would totally love that. Uh, see more and more of that, you know, because we all need to use our creative skills. You know, and that's different for every person. Um, we have to take that upon ourselves. We can't rely on the expert for everything. You know, some things, you know, it's fine. I don't want to learn about, uh, you know, how to make a, a big power plant. Uh, so I'll let them do it. But, you know, we don't need big power plants necessarily anyways. We can create our own smaller ones that aren't metered, that are cheaper, so we don't have to spend so much time making money at a job we don't like so we can make more time to do what we do like, or at least explore what we do like. So hopefully we can do what we love. So again, you know, it always comes down to, for me, what can you do with your time and energy to live a more fulfilling life? And it's totally up to you and you alone what that is about. Yeah, well, you know, people are people everywhere regardless of culture. Culture certainly makes a big difference, though, on us. It, it shapes us in so many ways. So, but when you go into a hackerspace anywhere in the world, you know you're in a hackerspace. You know, there's just people enthusiastically sharing and there's tools all over the place and it's just, you know you're in a hackerspace when you're in one. But there are definitely different focuses uh, in different places. 
Um, where areas are depressed economically, there are more people working on uh, starting businesses. Uh, and likewise, like in Silicon Valley, there's more people focused on it because that's part of their culture. Um, and uh, in places where the economy is going good, there's more people just doing kind of fun, frivolous things because they can. Uh, some places like in Japan or China, they're focused on more in robots. Just, I'm not sure why, but that seems to be more of that there. Um, I don't see all that much difference between like Europe and North America, for instance, though. We seem to share enough of the hacking culture and culture at large together. Yeah, clearly. Um, you know, in my view, everything's political. You know, the personal is political. Because uh, anything we do affects the world around us. It's just a matter of degree. But if uh, a lot of people are getting together in unique community centers around the world, uh, hackerspaces, then people are exploring and doing what they love, which is changing not only their lives, but the people around them. And that changes the world and the whole community. This is changing the world not in a small way, but in a rather big way. And that is political. In each place, it's going to be um, more or less of an influence on the community around. But uh, some places it will overflow into uh, actually electoral kind of politics. Um, in the United States, it tends to be less so than in Europe. In China, obviously less so than in North America. Uh, it's kind of dangerous to form opposition parties, but, um, but still, when people form together in a uh, supportive community, of course they're going to talk about all sorts of things and not just uh, the things that they're hacking on. But we can hack not just electronics and computers, but society. We can take society the way it is, improve upon it to the best of our ability, and share it. This is hacking. You know, this is society hacking, and we're doing this. We're making the world a better place in all of these different ways. Uh, you know, NoiseBridge, uh, when, when we co-founded NoiseBridge, uh, there weren't many models to draw from. Uh, there were a handful of hackerspaces, mostly in Germany, and that was about it. So when we uh, created NoiseBridge, we wanted to do it in our own way, in our own unique way. And me and the person who had the initial idea, my friend Jake, we're both anarchists at heart. And we wanted to create a, an organization, a community, that was as anarchy as possible. And so we eventually ended up creating a community that has no leaders and only one rule. And that rule is be excellent to each other. And that rule is, uh, we hoped, and it turned out to be true, what would keep the community alive and growing all the time, because that's subjective. You know, what is excellent? What is not excellent? It's subjective. It's different for different people. And we all have to continually work this out with one another. Community is never easy. <laughs> never. It's never going to be easy. But if everyone works things out, and we grow as a result, and it works for everybody, and everyone gets more out than they put in, it's fantastic. So that keeps it growing, that keeps it alive, and it keeps it friendly, because our one rule is all about that. Yeah, I think it can. Um, Different companies, of course, run themselves differently. Google is maybe uh, exceptional as far as how it runs itself. Uh, their one tagline is uh, don't do evil, which is sort of like NoiseBridge's one rule, but it's the negative side. I wish they would have picked something positive like we did instead. Um, but still, employees there have much more freedom. They aren't stuck in one cubicle where they sit at a desk. They're in a cubicle that's a like huge, weird shape with a lot of people and diverse uh, uh, projects. And they have a lot of free time. And you know, so it's kind of an interesting environment. And we see that Google's very success successful doing things this way. My own company, Cornfield Electronics, I run exactly the same way. Uh, it's my vision, and I get final say. Um, but uh, you know, other than that, it's really the same as NoiseBridge. We run by consensus. So I know what I would like, but I don't do anything without making sure everyone is happy enough with it. And other people will give their ideas, and they're going to make sure uh, that it's important to them that we're all happy with it. And you know, we, we often do really cool things as a result. I'm not the only brain in our group. Uh, and I don't want to be a leader. It takes too much work. <laughs> the next revolution? Uh, Industrial revolution. 
oh, well, I don't know if it'll be industrial. Uh, that theory has kind of been tried already, and uh, it worked maybe in some manner of uh, working for a while. But, um, yeah, but, you know, as far as people making things, uh, I think we're just at the beginning of this and where it will lead. I don't know. It's kind of exciting to be part of it, though. Well, I don't think it's a fight. Uh, we're coexisting now. Um, I, I certainly want to be a, as a part of the consumerist society as little as possible. Um, you know, by existing on our planet, we're using resources, but it's a matter of degree how much resources we use and how much impact we have negatively. No matter what, we'll have a negative impact. But personally, I want to have as little negative impact as possible and I want to have as great a positive impact as possible. Uh, and to me, positive means helping people find what's positive for them as they define it. Um, so the consumerist society, though, is depleting our resources on our planet that's a, that needs to support us in alarming rates. And I would like to see that diminish. Uh, by more and more people doing stuff on their own, they can take stuff from the consumer society that's already been made, uh, repurpose it if necessary or if desired, um, or fix it, and then it becomes useful instead of toxic waste in some landfill or in a pile in China or India where it gets burned for whatever minerals. Um, yeah, so I don't see them as antithetical to one another. It's not mutually exclusive. Personally, I would like to see less and less of this consumerist society depleting our resources and more and more people getting together so that we can do more and more with less and less, as Bucky Fuller proposed. Well, certainly it's possible, and it'll be way better, because the economy worked for 100,000 years or more since we've been on the planet, but without all of that stuff. All that stuff is this much of our human history. We don't need to make something that's going to break purposely just to make more money. You know, like fine, profit. There's nothing wrong with profit, but there is something wrong with maximizing profit without any concern whatsoever of to the consequences. This is horrible, and this is the problem we have on our planet right now, is this has been going on for way too long. We need to take responsibility for what we do, individually and collectively. So just because I have a job where uh, I'm expected to make maximum profits for this corporation doesn't mean that I have to do something that's going to hurt me, my community, the people I work with, and the community and the planet. We don't have to do that. In fact, I believe we have an obligation to not do that and to do the opposite, to make life better for ourselves and the people around us. And we can. We don't need to maximize, pro maximize profit. We can make enough. There's this concept that's really important and that is really scarce on our Western world and so many other places on our modern planet. Enough. Enough. We can have enough to live lives that we love. And if we get enough to keep living lives we love, what could be more successful than that? My life motive? Yeah. <laughs> you know, my life keeps changing. You know, I will, as long as I am alive, I'm going to keep exploring and doing what I love. It's a moving target, but I'm going to keep exploring and doing what I love. I want to be as happy and healthy as I can under the circum circumstances while I'm alive.